Yeah, I, I'm going to pray first before we begin worshiping. And don't mind the people over here. They'll, no, I'm kidding. Um, all right. So, Jesus, we just want to come before you and thank you for this morning. Um, I just thank you for the gift that it is um, and the fact that, um, yeah, we definitely don't deserve to be here. And yet you allow us to be. Um, I just pray that you would ready our hearts just for worship and for um, just the rest of the day. Um, yeah, Lord, and that we would just remember to um, that you're with us and that you're here. Um, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Jesus, thank you so much um, for being worthy um, of all we have to bring and for allowing us to bring that to you. We thank you for your goodness um, and the promises that you make to us. And ultimately, we're just thankful for um, what you did to bring us here. And yeah, we just praise you for your goodness, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, and welcome to chapel. So glad you're here today. Let's go ahead and pray uh, as the choir makes their way off the stage. Dear Jesus, we thank you for today. This is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and get, be glad about it. Thank you for the gift of another day to, to love you, to serve you, to love others around us. Lord, I thank you that you have given us this opportunity to gather together to worship you, to hear um, a beautiful choir sing about how we should praise and glorify you. Why? Because you're worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, we just thank you for today. We give you honor and glory. Pray that you would just speak to us today as we have come to this place to, to not only to come together to worship you, but also to hear from you. I pray that you would speak to us today. Pray that you would quiet our hearts that we would quiet any distractions that are going on around us, um, and that you would help us to just tune in and listen to what you want to say to us today. We thank you for the truth that you want to speak to us. What a privilege it is that the, the creator of the world, the creator of the universe wants to speak to us. And so, Lord, we just listen. We tune in to listen to what you want to say to us today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, choir, for that performance. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful. We're trying to get the choir to be more involved uh, here in chapel and just to be able to give the rest of the student body an opportunity to hear and enjoy the hard work that they put into uh, to singing. And so thank you, choir. It was awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of students to come up. They have uh, an opportunity for all of you to, uh, to be involved uh, with a, a new project here on campus. And then after that, President Jans is going to come up and introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Aubrey Laird, and this is... Kylie Davis. And, oh. um, and we are excited to announce the beginning of Tabor's first literary and art journal, Quill. Um, Quill will be student edited and designed, and the purpose of this journal is to feature student work, whether that be short stories, poetry, creative nonfiction, art, or photography. Submissions will be sent to our email, quill at tabor.edu, and the deadline for submissions is March 17th. Uh, more information about submission requirements will come out soon on our webpage. Uh, thank you. If you love writing our art, we would love to see your submissions. Good morning, Tabor College. It is a wonderful day today to be at Tabor, and I see a lot of pink and red and celebrating uh, Valentine's today, and so that's fantastic. Uh, it is also uh, a day that we have a home basketball game tonight. I'm super excited about that, playing Bethel tonight. And if you knew or not, today is Ash Wednesday. Today is a day that we, the church, typically celebrate in beginning the season of leading up towards Easter. And so I encourage you over these next weeks as we lead, as we 
move towards Easter to set your hearts on thinking of Christ and thinking of Christ's death and resurrection and in thankfulness and joy. And so begin preparing your hearts for just a wonderful Easter. It's my privilege today to introduce our speakers. Uh, speaker. So we have Dr. Reverend Jeff Wheland and his wife Maggie are with us today. I won't give a full introduction because they'll share some of their testimony and story in, in their talk, but uh, they come to us from Reedley, California. Uh, yep, yeah, we've got a few of you. Uh, uh, hold your hand up if you're from California. All right, keep your hand up if you're from Reedley, California. We've got a couple of you um, who are from there, and this is your pastor for a few of you. Uh, and so he is the pastor of Reedley Mennonite Brethren Church, uh, one of the larger, largest Mennonite Brethren churches in the nation. And it has just been a joy to get to know Jeff and his wife, Maggie. Their son, Joseph, is here as well. And so welcome them. If you see them today at lunch or throughout uh, this evening at the game, whatever, I invite you to come and speak with them. They love talking to students. And so uh, I invite you to the stage. Thank you so much. Let's give a big Tabor welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Jansen. Well, it's a, a great honor to be here. Again, we're coming from California, so I hate to admit this, but in the Super Bowl, I was going for the 49ers, but the Chiefs won. How many Chief fans do we have here today? Quite a few Chief fans. My hometown is Colorado Springs, Colorado. How many Bronco fans? Denver. Viking fans. Okay, Vikings, any, and I pastored in Dallas area in Houston, Texas. Any Cowboy fans? To the Cowboys fans, I want to say this, I am available for counseling. Again, yes, yeah, somebody said they need it. Again, it's a great honor to be here. Very proud of you on so many different fronts. But I want to encourage you today, I've heard like 82% of the student body is involved in athletics. I don't know if I've ever heard that type of statistic at a Christian college. So that's tremendous. I heard that tonight is one of your big rivalry games. I'm planning on being there. And I want to give a shout out to the girls team because they're number one in the conference. That is tremendous. So... Looking forward to being at those games tonight. Let me lead us in prayer, and I'll share very briefly. My wife is going to come, and then I'll wrap it up. Lord, I'm just so grateful to be here at Tabor. Bless this school in every way and all of the students. Encourage them today. Thank you for the faculty and the staff that have this mission from God to be here and to teach and encourage and support these students. So bless them in every way, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was about four years old, I remember saying to my mom and dad, if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven, because that's what my babysitter said to me. I remember sharing that with my parents, and they said that none of us are good enough to get to heaven on our own. I think of what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So I realized after my parents shared the good news of Jesus with me that I was a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross. He substituted in my place so that when I die, I don't have to go to hell. He shed his blood, only his blood washes away our sin. He's alive, and I remember getting down on my knees as a child and inviting Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. So that was probably when I was four or five years old, and some of you have that testimony as well. But when I was in sixth grade, about 12 years old, college near Chicago, and I remember my senior year, there was this big phrase, I don't know if they use it here, but it was called senior panic. In other words, senior panic was, I am never going to be around this many people of the opposite sex. This is my best chance I'm going to have to get married. And there seemed to be pressure on us as seniors. What are we going to do? Are we going to go off to grad school? The person that we're dating, 
Are we going to end up getting married? There was a lot of panic and anxiety during my senior year, and there seemed to be some pressure, but I remember graduating from college being single. I went off to seminary at Dallas Theological Seminary. My professor was Dr. Howard Hendricks, the former chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys. But this is what he said to us as students. And I never forgot. I was 22 years old. I went straight from college right away to grad school. But he said, if you want to improve your prayer life, you need to do three things. Well, I really wanted my prayer to be powerful and effective. He said, the first thing you do is you pray with children. Why? Because kids are so open and honest. They'll pray about that stray cat or their best friend's video game that broke down. They're just very honest with God. He said the second thing to do is pray with new Christians because they're real honest. They don't tour the Milky Way and use all of these fancy theological words. They're just honest. And he said the third way is pray the word of God, because God loves to be reminded of his promises. Well, again, I was single at the time at 22 years old. So what I did is I just took the Bible and I started going through all the verses in the Bible of different characteristics that I wanted to pray for in a future spouse. So I took that professor at his word. I just started copying down all of these verses and I would just say the verse out loud and then pray it back to God. I remember different nights of prayer and fasting, of just abstaining from food to say, God, I really want to get married and I'm praying for all of these biblical characteristics in my future spouse. Well, in all honesty, there were times of loneliness. It didn't happen right away. And then years after I graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary, I was called up to active duty as a U.S. Army chaplain during the Iraq War. So I was stationed in Saddam Hussein's hometown where Saddam Hussein was born and where he was captured. I was not a fighter during the war. I was a non-combatant. I was the chaplain. I was the pastor to about 600 U.S. Army soldiers. But during the Iraq war, I met another soldier that was a Christian. He was single as well. And we started praying for each other and for our future spouses. Well, soon after I got back from the war of Iraq, again, still single, discouraged at times because I'd prayed for so long. I got discouraged, but I went to this pastor's conference and the district superintendent, the bishop, basically laid his hands on me and prayed for a Christian spouse. And about a month later is when I met Maggie, and we've been married now for almost 18 years. So God answers prayer. But I remember feeling discouraged. I want to encourage you with this verse because maybe some of you are saying, you know what, Jeff, or pastor, I've been praying this way for a long time. But I remember one time I was so discouraged. I thought, should I even pray anymore about finding a Christian spouse, and I was ready to quit. I was discouraged. And all of a sudden, when I was ready to quit and I was so discouraged, Luke 18 verse 1 came to my mind. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. And that's what I want to say to you today. Maybe you're saying, Jeff, I've been praying about this difficulty in my life. Or I'm praying about that future spouse. Maybe I should just quit. I'm so discouraged. I want to give up. And what I would say to you is never quit praying about that situation. So I remember specifically praying the word of God for about 10 years. And finally, after 10 years is when God answered my prayer. Now that's my side of the story. My wife is going to come up next and share her side of the story. No. Okay. <laughs> you might need to turn the down. Hello? Okay. There we go. Now it's on. Yeah, there we go. Good morning, Tabor. It's a blessing and a pleasure for me here to be today. And I want to start with this verse of the Bible that says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell of your wonderful deeds. This is in Psalm 9 1. 
And today, I am here because of God's wonderful deeds. You have heard the story of my husband, and today is Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day, sometimes when you're single, is not as much fun. <laughs> and for me, my story started when I was very young. I was born in Peru, South America. I have um, two brothers, one sister and two stepsisters. And I grew up in a home with my mom who always take me to church. I invited Jesus in my heart when I was seven years old. His reckless love really drew me to him. I was in love with a God that would just give everything for me. So at the age of eight, my mom encouraged me to start praying for my future husband. And for a girl that dreamed about Hallmark movie romances, before they existed, I was all in. I was like, yes, I can pray for that. So I said to my mom, can I ask anything I want? And she said, yes, you can. God can do anything. So by the age of 15, I was in love with this anime show called Candy, who follows the adventures of an orphan girl who falls in love with a prince. And guess what? The prince has blue eyes and blown her. And the thing is, in my country, there's not too many people with blonde eyes and blue hair. No, actually, with blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> Did you get it? Um, so it was incredible to me because as I followed the story of this orphan girl, I kind of fell in love with that prince. And I said to God, God, could you give me a husband that has blonde hair and blue eyes and a man who loves you? So I, as I start growing up, during that time, I work very close with my youth pastor's wife. She was like a second mother to me. And then during college, I doubted God's best for me. And I settled for a relationship that only brought heartache and pain in my life. But I got back with God. And in 2003, God opened the door for me to come to the United States through an intercultural exchange program. I lived six months in Chicago and then six months in San Francisco, California. It was a great, great experience. But during the time, I made going to church a priority for me. So every Sunday, I got up and I went to church. But the thing is, I visited a Baptist church, which I met wonderful people in Chicago. But for this Latino girl, that was way too quiet. I always had to find my hand going up and moving and then a friend invited me to a Pentecostal church. And that was another unique experience. Crying out loud during service was not something that was, I was comfortable with, you know? So I decided to stick with my denomination. I grew up in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So I say this, God, could you give me a husband that has blonde hair, blue eyes, that goes to the Christian and Missionary Alliance? And after that year was over, I went back home and I work with my youth pastor's wife as a translator. They had missionaries from the United States come and I would just tag along and translate for them. During one day, my, my pastor's wife said to me, May, would you consider being a pastor's wife? I think you would be great at it. And that actually came in as an answer to me because during that time, I was doubting what kind of job my future husband will have. Did he have time for church? Well, if you're a pastor's wife, you will be at church all the time, right? So I thought, that is a great thing. So I added one more thing, occupation, pastor. Then, then nothing was happening in my life. I was still waiting and waiting for God's best. And to top it all, my sister moved to Canada. She met this guy. And after a short time, they were engaged, and now she was, she was going to get married. I was very happy for her. She's a year older than me. But I was sad for me. I was like, when is it going to be my turn? Well, my sister um, encouraged me to apply to go to Canada. I ended up moving to Canada. And I met my future brother-in-law. He was amazing, and he's still amazing in every possible way. But there was one thing. He was bold. And that was not a big deal to my sister. But it was a big deal to me, and I was like, Babe, I better get going and say, God, could you give me a husband with lots and lots of hair? And, and, you know, I added those things into my list. You might think that is not a big deal, but God cares about every single detail of our lives. 
So after that, I settled in Canada, and one day I woke up thinking, maybe I have it all wrong. Maybe God wants me single. And I was like, you know, God, I am going to stop praying for a husband because I want to be the most joyful single woman out there. And if this is what you have for me, you know what? It's going to be great. So I decided to quit praying for my husband. And my sister, I kind of forgot one detail. My sister told me that she met her husband in Christian Mingle. Christian Mingle is a dating website. Uh, so I was there for a while, met a lot of guys that say they were Christians, but really they were not living for the Lord. So I quit it after that. And after deciding quitting praying for a husband, I went to church. And I was late because the traffic was heavy that day. And as I opened the door, the pastor looked me in the eye and he said, do not quit. Three times. So I went home and I said, God, I think I had it all wrong because you do not want me to quit praying for a husband. What you want me to quit is telling you when to bring him. So I surrendered the desire to have a husband to you. And may you bring him in the right time to me. And what happened the next week is incredible. Because for three nights, as I was sleeping, I hear this voice saying, go to Christian Mingle. And I'm like, I'm not going to Christian Mingle. <laughs> the second night, go to Christian Mingle. I'm not going to Christian Mingo. And the third night, go to Christian Mingo. And I say, okay, okay, I'm going to go to Christian Mingo. I'm going to reopen my profile for five minutes, God. Five minutes. That's all I can do. I don't want to do more than five minutes. I sat in the computer, and I was praying and terrified. God, you, you have to bring the man for me in the next five minutes. Two minutes into it, a guy named Jeff sends me, um, a message. And as soon as he sends me the message, I check his profile. Hair, blonde, check. Eyes, blue, check. Occupation, pastor, check. I was worried how old he was. So, uh, because in my culture, pastors really, when they're pastors, because it's such a long study, sometimes you have to work a job and being a pastor, so you usually finish sometimes your career when you are like 40. So, I was like, okay, 32 is a good number, because I was 29. Um, and the rest is history. God did, oh, but this is the thing. After the next day, he said, I think you should check my website of the church that I pastor. So I check, and there it is, the logo of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So this is wow and double wow. But I want to encourage you with something. This is nothing of me or Jeff. God did not give us each other because we were perfect. God gave us each other because he is perfect and he is good. And he took 20 years to write my love story. And he is writing your love story. If you are discouraged, do not settle for anything less than God's best. He's going to give you that girl and that guy that you dream of. And my encouragement to you is pray, pray, and pray some more. And give him all the details about it. And I want to encourage you in Ephesians 3.20. It says, now unto him who's able to do immeasurably more than we ask of imagine. He is able to do immeasurably more. And I hope you feel encouraged today. And if you want to see me around there, talk to me. I would love to pray with you. Thank you so much. Let me pray. Señor Jesús, gracias porque tú eres un Dios bueno y misericordioso. Gracias porque tú nos amas y gracias porque tú eres un experto en escribir nuestras historias de amor. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. In closing, again, it just shows how God honors specific persistent prayer. But I just want to share three closing thoughts with you because, again, maybe you're saying, Jeff, I really have that desire to get married. It's not working for me right now. But I want to talk to you about three characteristics that are going to happen in your love story when God writes that. And the first area is attraction. It's interesting in Song of Solomon, in Song of Solomon chapter 4, the guy lists all of these things that he finds attractive in the girl that he's going to marry. Now, I'm just trying to be very honest because like many of you, I grew up in the church culture. I just remember saying this to my dad. I said, Dad, I'm really scared 
to surrender my life to Jesus when it comes to finding a Christian mate? What happens if God sticks me with someone I'm not at all attracted to? And I remember my dad saying to me, Jeff, that is ridiculous. Because when it is God's will, he is going to have you attracted to that person. In fact, Solomon talks about that in the book of Proverbs. May you ever be captivated by her love. Now maybe you're saying, well, Jeff, I can't believe you're bringing this up. It sounds like such carnal, secular advice. I'm here to say, when God writes your love story, you will be attracted to that person. God's going to work in your life. You will be attracted to that person. The second A, I would say, when God writes your love story, is admiration. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 10, the girl talks about how she admires the guy that she's going to marry. I want to challenge you this way. Maybe you're saying, right now I'm in a dating relationship. I would ask you this. If you're the guy, that girl that you're dating, do they respect you? Do they admire you? I remember when I was dating Maggie, and I remember she would say to my sermons, and she would say, Jeff, you're a man of God, or I really appreciate your preaching ministry. She was respecting me, admiring me. Isn't it interesting that a guy's greatest need is respect? Paul says in Ephesians 5.33, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So a girl's greatest need is love. A guy's greatest need is respect. So if you're a guy today and you're in a dating relationship, I would say to you, when God is writing your love story, there's going to be admiration there. There's going to be respect. If that girl that you're dating is always putting you down, I would say, stop that relationship. When it is of God, that person is going to admire you and respect you. And maybe you're saying, well, the guy that I'm dating right now, maybe you're a girl, you're saying the guy that I'm dating right now, he just doesn't have that many qualities that I respect. I would say then you should hold off on that relationship because when God is writing your love story, there's going to be attraction, but there's also going to be admiration. You're going to respect that guy. And then the final thing I would say is there's going to be awe. Now it's amazing to me in Genesis 24, by the way, God does care about your love life. He does care about your romantic relationships. Isn't it interesting that Genesis 24 is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis? Out of 50 chapters, chapter 24 is the longest. It's a love story between Isaac and Rebekah. Now, Isaac is 40 years old. He's single. They didn't have Christian mingle or eHarmony back then. They didn't have Tabor College, where there are so many guys, so many girls. What happens is Abraham's servant goes off to present-day Iraq, and he is looking for a wife for Isaac. This is an arranged marriage, and he gets so specific in his prayer Abraham's servant. He says, God, if such and such happens, let me know that she's the one. God does it, and it's Rebecca. She's a beautiful woman. Rebecca is a beautiful woman. She has a compassionate, caring heart. She waters all of these camels for a stranger, which would have taken a couple of hours. And once Rebecca's family hears about this, Abraham's servant, this arranged marriage, you know what they say? This is from God. This is only from the Lord. So when God writes your love story, there's going to be a sense of awe. Thank you, God, for bringing that person in my life. I want to ask you, in your dating relationships, in your courtship, can you see God's hand in this? Is it something that you can say, praise God? Because when it is of God, there's going to be a sense of awe. And I remember on our wedding invitations, we actually put Genesis 24 on our wedding invitations and that phraseology in that chapter, this is from God. So I want to encourage you, why not pray that way? Maybe you're saying, Jeff, I'm single, I'm lonely, I'm discouraged. I'd love if God would write my love story. Why not pray this way? God, you can do anything. Do such great things in my love story in my dating life, in my courtship, that only you get the glory. 
So when God writes your love story, there are going to be three characteristics that are true of your love story. First, attraction. He's going to work in your life that you're attracted to that person that he has for you. Secondly, when it's of God, there's going to be admiration. If you're the guy, that girl that God wants you to marry is going to respect you. She's going to have that ability to point strengths out that you have. And finally, when God writes your love story, there's going to be awe. In other words, praise God. Only God could have done this. Now, I want to encourage all of us, God wants to write your love story. But I think of what the Bible says in an area of struggle in my own life when I was in college and your age. I remember having so many problems in college, and one day I was so discouraged, I thought to myself, does God really even love me? Why am I having so many problems in my college experience? And all of a sudden, as soon as I had that doubt, Romans 5 verse 8 came to my mind. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you're like me as a college student, and you've gone through a difficult time, you thought, how do I know God really loves me? How do I know he cares for me? Through the cross, he's saying, I love you. I care about you. I'm interested in you. So I want to encourage, God wants to write your love story. He loves you so much. Have you ever come to that place in your life where you've admitted that you're a sinner? You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. Only his shed blood can wash away our sin. Jesus is alive, and it's an open invitation to the entire world. Regardless of our age or our past, no matter what we've done in our past, it's an open invitation. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, period. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm not going to embarrass you or call out your name or call you forward. But with all eyes closed and heads bowed, I will not embarrass you. But I'm giving you the same opportunity I gave to the American soldiers during the Iraq War. Maybe you're saying, Jeff, I've never called on Jesus for salvation before, but today I want to. I will not embarrass you. But if that's you, you're saying, I've never called on Jesus for salvation, but today I want to. If that's you, I won't embarrass you, but would you slip up your hand? And for any that may have raised their hand, I just want to encourage you in the privacy of your heart and privacy of your seat to pray this to the Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, please forgive me for all of my sin. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Lord Jesus Christ, save me. Come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And my encouragement to you today, not only is God able to write your love story, but he loves all of you more than you can possibly imagine. Thank you.